Well, I'd like to welcome everyone um, and thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Erica Palafox and I'm a community program specialist for San Mateo County Libraries. I'm very excited to be here today with Bay Area author Ileana Masonette to chat about her new book, The Asporrican, a Puerto Rican cookbook. Before we begin, I have a few reminders. Later this month on Wednesday, March 22nd, we will be having a conversation with Meng Jin, who's the author of the short story collection, Self-Portrait with Ghost. As for tonight's logistics, your microphone and video will be turned off, but please feel free to use the chat and submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A. For those who'd like to access live closed captions for this event, uh, please click on CC and then click on show subtitle. And now I'm very happy to introduce Ileana Masonette. Ileana Masonette was the United States' first Puerto Rican food columnist for a major newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle. She has hosted sold out pop-up dinners across the San Francisco Bay Area. She's an IACP award winner for narrative food writing. She has collaborated with Jose Andres for Steven Spielberg's West Side Story Wrap Party, contributed recipes to Rancho Gordo, authored a crowdfunded booklet, cookbooklet, and has written for the Los Angeles Times, Savur, Food and Wine, Lucky Peach, Food 52, Eatery SF, and more. I'm glad to be in conversation with you tonight, Ileana. Hi, thanks for having me. We are very lucky today because before our conversation in Q&A, Ileana is going to read a portion of her book for us a book that's filled with beautiful writing alongside those uh, mouth-watering recipes with those great pictures that we were just talking about. So for a few moments, everyone sit back, relax, and enjoy listening to Ileana. How I Became a Cook is not a romantic story. I learned how to cook Puerto Rican food from my grandmother, Margarita Galindez Maisonet. Margarita was born in 1938 in the Campo of Manati on the northern coast of the island, not too far from Hacienda La Esperanza, a former sugarcane plantation. When Margarita was nine years old and in the third grade, she was sent to live with her titi Emilia. That was the end of Margarita's formal education. That was also the end of seeing her biological mother for several decades. Margarita went to work as a domestic during a time when people didn't have to apologize for deep frying their foods when it was the way of life. There would be no passing down of heirloom cookbooks. I don't even think my grandma ever owned a cookbook. Words of encouragement or time to enjoy a childhood. By the time that Margarita was 14 years old, she was already pregnant with, first, with the first of her seven children, Carmen, my mother, Margarita, Carmen, and I became cooks out of economic necessity. We did not have the privilege of cooking for our pleasure or joy. Our story is one of generational poverty and trauma with glimpses of pride and laughter, all of which have been the catalyst of ample good food in my life. My own days begin with, the, with only the sound of my feet shuffling through dawn's sleepy light. I turn on the stove, shuffle to the sink, the faucet knob squeaks and the aerator spits. My black pinky toenail and I wait impatiently for the spouted Le Creuset pot to fill with water. Shuffle to put the pot on the burner. The pour over cone goes on top of the coffee mug, the coffee filter into the pour over cone, then the coffee grounds. In the meantime, I open all the windows in the front of the house to let the morning coolness seep through the mesh screens. By the time my shuffling feet make it back to the stove, the water is bubbling. I pour the water over the coffee grounds and the conjured smell of the foggy mountains in the interior of Puerto Rico fills my California kitchen. The water sinks into the, the water sinks into and penetrates the cone, sending the Dominion brew into the cup below. A flourish of cream ends my ceremony. This entire process mirrors my late grandmother's morning routine. Although her pot of choice was a small aluminum Farberware made in the Bronx, and her pearl of a cone was a colador. She began every waking morning with this routine, a necessary moment of meditation and coffee to galvanize her weary body into the next step, starting the daily meals, which always consisted of rice and beans. Many of the old Puerto Rican recipes aren't quick and easy, which might be one of the reasons that the food of the island hasn't exactly taken off in the land that sits mere hours away. 
Another reason is probably because people don't understand the cuisine. Hell, most people don't understand us. How can brothers and sisters from the same two parents range in color from white to black, they ask? Colonialism. There are white Puerto Ricans getting radical and surfing as they gone with sun bleached blonde hair and black Puerto Ricans with Afros creating arts and crafts and Luisa and everything in between. And our food reflects that diversity. We know how much people love to have things simplified so it all fits neatly into a little box. The truth is, Puerto Rican cuisine shares a lot in common with the cuisines of Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippines, all the places that got fucked by the Spanish and United States colonialism. To most, Puerto Rico is just a pit stop on their boat cruise to the Bahamas. I loved old San Juan and Mofongo is the common response I hear when I tell someone I'm Puerto Rican. To Puerto Ricans, Puerto Rico represents a constant battle for land and a broad understanding of our identity. When my family first came to the States and my mother was enrolled in elementary school, she didn't speak any English. During the country's Cold War era security push, it became necessary to read and write English well, which meant that racist policies such as the no Spanish rule lingered in the newly desegregated schools. And so my mother just didn't speak. It was a decision that would mold her personality to this day, and the reason that I don't speak Spanish. A more confrontational person might have rebelled and fought. That's not my mother's way. How could she have been confrontational at five years old? Well, ask my mom what happened when my kindergarten teacher wouldn't let me wash my hands after I went to the bathroom. All hell broke loose. I suppose because of my mother's inability to speak out, she made sure that I was the opposite of her in that way. Thank you, Eliana. Thank you Thanks. so much for reading that. Let's see. Um, now, if you're ready, I'd love to jump into conversation. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you. And just a friendly reminder um, that you can add any questions you have to the Zoom Q&A. Okay, let's see, Eliana. The first question I have for you is, where does your, insp where does your inspiration come from in developing your cookbook? Um. I mean, I'm not really sure, like, <clears throat> I guess where most people's inspiration comes from, just like your daily life, you know, like your surroundings. I, I feel like to some of us, you know, things like the recipes in my book might seem unusual to other people, but that's just my life. Thank you. Uh, somebody just um, in, entered a question and they're asking, where is the best pernil in the Bay Area? Um, I, I don't really like to use the, the best when it comes to things because everybody is different. You know, what I like is not necessarily what somebody else might like and vice versa, you know? So I wouldn't say where the best bed meal is, you know, but I know where there's some pretty damn good bed meal, you know, and that's at um, La Perla in Oakland. Okay. Um, what surprised you most about the process of developing a cookbook? Um... Um, I'm not really sure. I'm, I, I'm not really a person that's often surprised by anything. Um, I think that comes with just being a pessimist, you know, so my, um, I think what surprised me is that, you know, my trajectory to get my cookbook published was a lot different than everyone else's. But as far as uh, getting the, uh, nothing really, nothing surprised me, nothing caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind talking a little bit about how your trajectory was different um, from other cookbooks? Um, well, yeah, I took, of course, you know, I had already been a columnist at the San Francisco Chronicle, so I already knew a lot of food writers in the industry, a lot of uh, published authors, you know, and I think I, I, I found out that um, they're kind of there is no one way to do things. There is no one way to get somebody's, to get your cookbook published. You know, everybody's, everybody's um, path might've been different, but I, I also don't feel like mm, my path 
took the longest out of everyone else's two you know mm-hmm. like uh, they're like you know oh you should do a little book and then I did a little book like oh you should become a columnist that you did a columnist oh you mm-hmm. have to you know build your portfolio and you know do a lot of you know write a lot of bylines and I did a lot of bylines oh you have to like win an award and I won an award and this shit still wasn't happening you know what I mean and I'm like okay like I'm doing everything that has worked for everyone else so you know why isn't it working for me I'm like okay Thank you. Uh, so there's a follow-up question, which is, uh, was the plan um, always to include not just the recipes, but also the history of the ingredients, dishes, cultures, um, colonization, migration, and some of your own memories? Um, you can't talk about, you can't talk about most food in the world without talking about any of those things. Okay. Is there a version of dumplings in Puerto Rican food? Um, I guess. I mean, I I figure that maybe empanadillas could be considered a dumpling, maybe. You know, like, is an empanada, like, considered a dumpling? It's a meat pie, right? Like, mm-hmm. in, like, relleno de papas, like, you know, it's like potatoes, you know and then it has like meat in the middle so I mean I think that that might also be considered a dumpling like I think it depends on what you consider a dumpling yes and all those um I don't know if all those are considered dumplings but all of those that you just mentioned <laughs> <laughs> yeah I don't know if they're considered dumplings or not but I, if 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 they are if they're not that's probably as close as we have to a dumpling. Um, one of our participants would like to, um, to know if you could talk more about the development of your burlap in barrel adobo and sazon because they're delicious. Um, I mean, can you elaborate on that? Like how much do you want to know? like how it began, what did I have to do, like, you know, it's a kind of, it's, it is and is not a long story. It did and did not take a long time, and everything with me, I feel like, probably takes longer than usual, because I'm such a hardhead. I have to make things difficult, you know, of course, because I have to do them in a specific way, so, like, um, with Burlap and Barrow, I, I'm not really sure or remember how I was introduced to Ethan, who's the co-founder of Burlap and Barrel. Um, You know, I just always happen to kind of run into people all the time in the industry, you know, Mm -hmm. and I knew that he had, he was working on a product with my friend Tunde Hue, and it was like a specific type of like um, Nigerian product that Tunde had helped them um, acquire. And I was like, oh, like, that's interesting, you know? And um, I had always kind of like sold pre-blends like Sazon and Adobe blends, like when I was in culinary school and stuff like that, because people didn't really know what it was. Back then, I feel like a lot more people are using Sazon now that are not um, like even you know, Latin kind of, like, there's so many people that use Sazon, it's, like, really surprising, but I would sell that stuff, um, like, you know, and just, like, make a little bit of money or whatever, so um, after I found out that the collaboration between them and Tende, I reached out to Ethan, and um, I said, like, oh, like, have you ever thought about doing, like, a, like, a Sazon and a double blend, and he was, like, yeah, he goes, like, but, like we don't want to be the ones we don't want to be the ones to do it like we would rather do it with somebody who already knows how to do those things and who is like you know Puerto Rican Mm -hmm. and I was like okay I was like well ta-da here I am (laughs) (laughs) and you know they're like okay so they had a a chote which is also known as a natto seed they already had that and um it was like a Guatemalan kind and that's when I started to learn that there are different types of achote around the world, of course. Like now there's like, you know, there's like a Vietnamese achote, there's like an Indian achote and, and you know, Guatemala achote, and all that stuff makes sense because those are all the places that, you know, use achote, duh. Like, you know, when, it makes sense that there would be achote in Guatemala because cochinita pibil, duh. Okay, so 
uh, you know, which is not Guatemala, but it's Oaxaca. It's from down there, you know, on the peninsula. So I was like, this, the Guatemalan achote is just a little too dark. I would like to get it closer to <clears throat> the color of Goya. But what I did not realize, I've been using Goya for years and years and years. I don't think I ever noticed that Goya uses dyes. Like they use a red dye and a yellow dye. And I never paid attention to that until I was like, why can't I get this color? If I'm going to convince Puerto Ricans to use this Sazon, it has to look as close as possible to the Sazon that they've been using for generations, right? Mm -hmm. Why can't I get it close to the color? And then when I looked, I was like, oh my God, they use dyes. Okay, well, I'm never going to get it to be that color then. Now it's going to take also a little bit of education on my part to teach people why it'll never be that color. So if you really look at like Sazon, like Goya Sazon, the ingredients in it, primarily all it is is just kind of like dyed MSG. Like, oh. There isn't like, a, there isn't a ton of achote in it. There isn't like a ton of cumin. There isn't like a ton of, um, you know, garlic. Like there, there's some seasoning in it, of course, but the primary flavor is like salt MSG and then dyes. And I was like, okay, awesome. So <laughs> I said, you know, they, Ethan's like, do you think that you can find an achote that you would like? And I said, probably. I said, you know, I wonder if we can get it from Puerto Rico. And he said, yes, you should go and see if you can get it from Puerto Rico. Okay, bye. And I was like, oh okay <laughs> I was like I could probably find somebody there sure and then I literally became like an achote sorcerer you know I called like around I you know I have colleagues and friends down there of course you know from working all these years and stuff and somehow or another I found a farmer in San Sebastian and you know he's a very small farmer and he can't get us like an enormous amount of achote because we use wild achote, you know, and we have to wait for mother nature. We have to wait for the season. We have to wait for all those things. So he can't get us like an enormous amount at one time, but he can get us a comfortable amount in batches. And it, it took me a really long time, you know, to, to find a farmer to, it took me a really long time to find a farmer. It took me a really long time to go through farmers that were like, yeah, we want to do it. And then they would just like totally disappear. And then they would never, they would ghost you basically, you know, like you would never hear from them again. It took me a really long time to, you know, get the, I had to do all the measurements, you know, and stuff like weigh them out and see what, but it was a really kind of crazy long process and I did not anticipate it being that involved I thought I would just be like yeah I want to do this and they would mix it together and it would be for sale and then that would be it wow um <laughs> before we go into the next question I just want to let you know Eliana somebody wrote a comment that said that um this talk when you talked about the uh, dyes is so interesting and they have your B&B &B ones and love them because they're so versatile Hey, thank you. Um, let's see, another one of our participants would like to know if there are any recipes that you worked on for the book that didn't actually make the book? And if so, how did you narrow them down? Oh, I have like a ton of recipes that didn't make the book. Like I have so many more recipes, you know, especially Puerto Rican recipes that didn't make the book. Money, money is always the deciding factor when it comes to me. If money is not an option, I would probably do so many so many things there would have been the only thing that I regret from the book is not being able to have enough to have more money to invest in more photos like people I know that's like one of the one of the complaints people are like oh there's not enough photos it's like yeah because there's not enough money like if I would have had more money there would have been more photos like those things cost you know because when you're looking at a photo you're not just looking at you know my cuñado's time where he just you know shows up and then clicks we're talking about you know uh you know Jillian Knox who was my food stylist and prop stylist we're talking about her having to cook that recipe her having to shop for that recipe her having to prep that recipe cook the recipe set the recipe up set the props and the dishes up you know we're talking about like a whole 
you know, day of shit that's going on behind that one photo. You know what I mean? Like, if I wanted to add like another 10 to 20 photos, which would have been great. If I would have had a photo for every recipe in that book, it would have been in an easily an additional fifty thousand dollars. Wow. Um, so a follow-up question is, are there plans um, in the works for a second book? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know what like is the United States obsession with like, okay, you've, you've conquered this thing. What's next? You know, like it took me, this, this book took me damn near 10 years to publish and it wasn't just like, you know, smooth sailing. It was this constant swimming against the currents type of thing. You know, I fought tooth and nail every step of the way to get this book published. And not only that, it was like a huge trauma dump. I'm exhausted. So is there another book? I don't know. And if there's not, I'm okay with that. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see this next question. Um, here we go. It's a little long, okay? Just letting you know ahead of time. I love Jose Andres' recent work with rebuilding Puerto Rico with World Central Kitchen. And as a chef born with autism and happened to be Mexican Native American on my dad's and Swedish Norwegian decent uh, descendant on my mom's side, any advice on diversity in food media? Um. I am having a hard time. I'm like a bullet point person, you know, mm -hmm. like people talk to me, I need like pow, 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 pow. So I'm trying to process this question first. In regards to any advice on the diversity in food media, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I have any, I don't have any advice on that. And I think I don't have any advice on that because I'm not, a person in power that can make any of those changes. Like all I can do is what I'm doing, which is existing as diversity within that system. But other than that, I don't have any advice because it's it's such a it's such a big question. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't have a ton of um I just don't have a ton of control over that type of thing. So it's a really hard question to answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yes, no, thank you for trying. Were there any pleasant or relieving surprises you encountered while writing the book? Um, not that I can really recall, you know, you know, we talked about this like a little, a little while ago that, you know, nothing really caught me by surprise. Um, are there any spring activities you are getting excited about? Uh, yeah, sleeping. Yay. <laughs> Afternoon naps. Yeah. Is there a favorite comfort dish or a couple dishes in the book? Um, yes, of course, you know, like most of those, most of those dishes are uh, comforting to me, you know, like my, I always feel really bad when people ask me um, what, what my favorite recipe to make in the book and my favorite recipe to eat in the book are very two different recipes, you know, um, like, but all of them are comforting to me because, you know, they all remind me of my grandma, basically, so. Okay. Um, this next question has a couple of parts to it. Um, okay. Just letting me know since I know you like uh, bullet points. Yes, <laughs> these ones are exceptionally hard for me to like remember. Okay, I'm going to try though. Okay. Um, the first part of it is Are there any local restaurants, events in the Bay Area where uh, we can try your recipes? No. No. Okay. <laughs> next, next part of the question. What are your favorite Puerto Rican restaurants in the Bay Area? And will we ever get one in the peninsula? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there will ever be one in the peninsula. There might be, who knows? Cause anything is possible. 
Um, all of the Puerto Rican restaurants in the Bay are my favorite because there are so few. So I like all of them for different things. You know what I mean? Like not all of them make everything great, but I always like, I like one thing at each and every one of them though. So they have like, you know, we have soul food in San Rafael. We have El Coqui in Santa Rosa. We have La Perla in Oakland, Parada 22 um, in the Hayton SF. Um, there's another one called Frutilandia and the Mission, but um, it's like half something and half Puerto Rican. It used to be like half Cuban or half Guatemalan or something like that, like half Nicaraguan, something like that. It's half and half. So, yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Who are your favorite people to cook with and why? And if someone were to cook you a meal, what would you want them to cook for you? I don't like cooking with anyone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like cooking with anyone. Um, I think, like, <clears throat> I, um, in a professional setting, you know, when you are working on the line or whatever, you know, you're not necessarily really cooking with your colleagues or other line cooks because you're kind of all like doing your own thing side by side, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But to like cook with somebody, you know, where you're like trying to cook and engage and, you know, I just don't have the patience for that, you know, like I'm not necessarily like an entertainer, like I just want to cook and sit down and then when we sit down, that is the time to talk. I definitely don't want to like sit there and talk to you while I'm cooking. I'm sorry. I just, nope. I don't like it. <laughs> Get out of the way. Get out of the kitchen. But you know, my mom and my grandma were also like that too. Like, you know, my grandma had like a type of kitchen where it was like, you know, the, the, the cooking area and then the dining room. So you can like, you know, the dining room was like in the kitchen. So you can mm -hmm. still sit in the kitchen and like watch her, but be out of the way. Mm -hmm. And my mom's kitchen growing up was also like that. So I think that's why I was able to be in the kitchen with them because I'm still out of the way. Like I'm not talking to them. I'm not really bothering them. I'm just, I'm just there, just being present. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that because actually my mom and my grandma were the same way. <laughs> like, don't they bother don't me. <laughs> They have stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but how about if someone were to cook for you, is there like a particular meal you'd like them to cook for you? No, because so few people cook for me. Anything that they cook for me, it's going to be amazing. Okay. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and this isn't a question, but it's a, a nice comment that somebody wrote um, in our chat, and I just wanted to share it with you, which um, they said, this is not just a cookbook, this is a must-have history of food for all Puerto Ricans in the diaspora. Mm, that's nice. Yes, <laughs> that was a nice comment. Um, okay, here we go. Oh, this one's interesting. They, this person's saying, let's stream a little bit. If someone said you can have any job you want, what would be your ideal job? I have it right now. No. Well, there you go. <laughs> I literally have my dream job. Like I am able to essentially write about what I want to write about. I can write about, you know, I mean, just because I'm writing about Puerto Rican food now doesn't mean that I won't change because you know, I still like to write about, um, you know, places in Northern California, like in the history and stuff like that, you know, like, mm -hmm. which is still tied to my upbringing. And it's still a part of history that is disappearing, you know, because I was born in 1981. So the world is moving so fast that a lot of the places that I grew up with, or even the style of things, the style of cuisine that, you know, like the style of uh, you know, corner liquor store, Chinese food, hot walk that I grew up with is really not around anymore in California, you know, and I love writing about that because it's becoming kind of like a thing of the past, you know, so I think that I'm always going to write about nostalgia, which is 
which is a horrible thing to write about because you're kind of stuck in the past and you're longing for a time that's never going to come. So you're basically torturing yourself, essentially. Um, but I, I always, I don't know, like, I get paid to do what I want. And to me, that's, I don't get paid a lot to do what I want, but... <laughs> <laughs> But I still get paid to do what I want, and it's it's amazing. Yeah, that's the goal: get yep. paid to do what you want. Exactly. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, one of our participants wrote that they love how you're so honest and tell it like it is. And I have to say, when I read your book, that was like one of the things that I loved about it. I mean, there were so many things, but that's one of the things that I really loved about it too, is that you really come across as, you know, as honest, and this is your opinion and you're not afraid to say it. Um, but I was wondering if you got any like bad feedback or, or backlash because of some of the themes that you talked about in your book? Um, I mean, maybe not because of the book, because I think that I had already gotten a lot of backlash just you know, the book is really kind of a culmination of all the years that I, you know, wrote for other publications and I wrote for the column and stuff like that. So I had already gotten that bad feedback a long time ago. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, by the time the book came out, I had kind of like, my following had kind of weeded itself out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where the Puerto Ricans who didn't, uh, you know, like me, were already gone anyway and they weren't coming back so I didn't really have to deal with that but I think the reason why I'm so honest now um oops I should put my do not disturb on okay thanks Rodney anyways um <laughs> I I'm, I mentioned it in my newsletter I think the reason why I'm so I try to be so forthright and honest now which I'm not always honest of course because sometimes we still have to um, I want to say preserve people's feelings, but essentially it's just, it's lying, you know? I mean, there's good lies and there's bad lies, I guess, you know, whatever. But I talk about it in my newsletter. I used to lie all the time. Like, and I don't even know why. Like, it was just like a thing. I used to just lie over just dumb things, you know? Like I would, you know, lie about like my upbringing. I would lie about my age. I would lie about, you know, my father. I was essentially kind of like creating like this this story about my father and you know nobody was ever going to really like call me out on it because he wasn't around anyway so it was like great I could create whatever type of father that I wanted you know because he wasn't around anyway so I spent so much of my younger years lying that now I have gone the polar opposite where I'm too honest so now I'm hoping that maybe by the time I'm like 50, it'll kind of like way out in the middle. <laughs> and I'll kind of just like maybe learn how to like, I don't know, not come in so hot, maybe be more like soft with it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, I, I have to tell it, I have to say, I always kind of give a disclaimer to people like when I'm in meetings and stuff like that, because, you know, I know that a lot of people that I'm working with my colleagues and in a professional landscape, you know, I'm always seen as like having like an unprofessional tone, but it's not that I, I mean that it's just that the way that my brain is processing stuff. If I take the time to process whatever's going on in my head and then filter it out, so when it comes out with like a, a like a passive voice, as I've learned, what's called a passive voice, I've kind of almost forgotten what it is I wanted to say in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm I'm trying to be mean or uncouth. I'm just literally just trying to get it out of my head as fast as I can before I forget what it is I'm trying to get across, what point I'm trying to get across. Right. Well, um, thank you. And I, I have to say that many of the participants here and I myself also did enjoy that honesty in your book. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, just letting you know ahead of time again, this is going to be a little bit of a long question again. Okay. <laughs> Prepare yourself, Eliana. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let's see. Food cultures change over time as new foods, flavors, and styles rise and fall. 
generations ago, Puerto Rican food influenced and was influenced by Dominican, Cuban, and other islands in the Caribbean. Where do you see the new influences coming from that will shape Puerto Rican food and cooking in the coming decade? Um, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say because I don't think that Puerto Rico will necessarily um, be receiving like the, um, I don't think that the cuisine of Puerto Rico will, will change. I don't think the outside forces will have a, an effect or a change in Puerto Rican cuisine as much as I feel like now it'll be the time where Puerto Rican cuisine will alter other foods. You know, like, because like, I wrote an, an article about it when, or a column about it when I was still at the Chronicle about beans, you know, and like how when I started going back to Puerto Rico as an adult, I started seeing a lot more black beans being offered, but only like in the tourist areas though. Okay. And I was like, that's interesting because, you know, black beans are very, are not a Puerto Rican thing. They're a very Cuban thing. And I don't remember my grandma ever cooking black beans ever, 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 ever. And I personally don't, I don't like black beans. Like I find them to be very, very, very starchy. Um, so I was like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, you know, these people are offering beans. Like, I wonder if it is, you know, if it's like an influence from somewhere. And also if it might be like an economic thing where black beans just might be cheaper for the restaurant to serve. So that made me delve into beans, which is, you know, why I just wrote the column on it, you know, like um and you know black beans did come to puerto rico from cuba and it's not that the and the you know the, the pink beans i had made a, a comment in the in the column about how pink beans um weren't really like you know like they were like i said that they were hard to find but what i was saying was the pink beans from my grandma's era so like you know which is which is now considered like an heirloom bean <laughs> That type of bean, the variety of pink bean that she ate is not really accessible because, you know, the stores there only offer like, you know, very limited types of beans, you know, it's not like they're offering like all the varieties that once existed and really to find anything that's considered heirloom in Puerto Rico is already difficult as it is, you know, so that's, that's what I meant by that. Um, I just think that Puerto Rican cuisine will have an effect on other people. It already kind of is. When I was talking about other people using Sazon that are not Puerto Rican, it's mm -hmm. already, that's already happening. Like when you look at so many like people, like, uh, you know, TV personalities or a lot of like the TikTok chefs and stuff like that, like so many people are just using like Sazon and adobo and like their everyday food and that food is not Puerto Rican. So it is already mm -hmm. happening. <laughs> Newsflash, it's coming, people. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if with, with, the, with the new trend for TikTok was like, you know, Sazon and dishes yep. that are Puerto Rican. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, there is like a, um, there is a, a man who, I don't know where he's from. I think he's like Middle Eastern and he has like a little bodega in New York and he cooks food. And I was watching him make his chopped cheese and he is not from New York. He was born somewhere else. I don't know where he's from, Lebanon or something. So he's not born here. He's not from New York. But when he makes his chopped cheese, I was watching him. He seasons his chopped cheese with Sazon. And I'm like, how did this man learn about Sazon? <laughs> I need to know. I, need, I have questions. I need answers. Mm -hmm. Yep, the Akiwe, exactly. How did he learn about that? It's very interesting to me. Did you learn about how he learned about the Sazon? Well, I haven't yet. <laughs> it's going to take some questions and some diving into it. Yeah. Yes. You'll have to share in your newsletter when you find out. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, you know, really happy that you were talking about beans because actually one of the questions is, one of the questions is, what is your favorite bean recipe? Um, my favorite bean recipe is my Nina Didi's recipe, which is in the book. 
It's a very simple recipe. The way my Nina Didi cooks is very simple anyway. Um, you know, she, and whether she knows it or not, you know, she's just living her life or whatever, but the way that she exists is like a very um, kind of old fashioned way. It's almost like she's living in Mexico, but in Stockton, California. Like, you know, she lives on a big piece of property and, you know, her old house and her old kitchen with like all her old cookware. And she just cooks very simply, like that's it. You know, like it's like the, the beans, the water, you know, maybe some type of meat in it, most times not, you know, a little bit of milk and some, and a little bit of cheese. But even, you know, when we go there, she'll make things like albondigas, you know, which is, you know, mm-hmm. she use water and bouillon, a little bit of the meatballs, some carrots and papas. And right at the end, she'll like, you know, add a little bit of like, you know, cilantro in it. And it's like, it's always like the best thing I've ever eaten. Yes, that sounded delicious. And I love the picture. I know when I, I first read that recipe, I was shocked that milk was one of the ingredients. I was like, what? You can add <laughs> milk to beans? And you've had beans with cheese, but never with milk. So yeah, it's, like, just, it's just a little bit of milk. It's not like, you know, a ton. It's just a little splash. And then just like a handful of cheese, you know, of course, the the end result doesn't look like the photo, right? Like, there's a lot of people that were talking about, you know, um, oh, there's no photo for me to follow in the book. Like, how do I know how it comes out? And I'm like, well, newsflash, even the ones with the photo, that's not, that's not what it comes, looks like. That's, it's stylized, you know, it's fantasy, it's aesthetic, it needs to be, we're talking about, you know, all these like humble dishes that are not necessarily like aesthetically pleasing. You know what I mean? Like, these are not like Instagram worthy photos so you know according to the magic of Jillian Knox who's the prop stylist and the food stylist you know she makes it look like what she wants it to look like for the book and then I look at it and I'm like eh. <laughs> you know like sometimes I don't care sometimes I'm like down sometimes I'm like sometimes I'm just like eh. like I don't really care you know but the final dish of my Nina Didi's beans does not look how it looks in the photo I know Okay, that that's very good to know. But yes, that was <laughs> when I saw that I was shocked. But I was like, I must try this next time. This <laughs> it sounds delicious. Um, so let's see. Going back a little bit to sazon, somebody's asking if is Puerto Rican sazon different from Cuban sazon and Dominican sazon? I have no idea. No. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. I'm just like, oh, that, that's going to be, yeah, one of those like, oh, I have to go uh, research. Um, yeah, and I don't know because I don't know anything about Dominican or Cuban food, so. That's fair. Let's see. Um, so in your recipe, Puerto Rican Lab, you wrote about yelling at people on social media for using the terms homage or inspired by. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts about Puerto Rican food reaching mainstream popularity? Um, you know, with that type of thing, there's a, it's always a double-edged sword, you know? Like, you're always happy that people are talking about it finally, but you already know that, you know, you already know that it's the beginning of the end. Like, <laughs> now it's like we're going to see, um, like, you know, wildly um how do you call it um I don't know we're gonna start seeing crazy customizable uh mofongos you know topped Mm. with all kinds of like shit with like skittles or something like that you know like it's gonna be really crazy and it's also gonna be there are also going to be people who are not Puerto Rican that are going to try to monetize on that. Mm. And that part is always not necessarily a a scary part, but it's, it's not scary, but it's always a little discerning, you know, like, Mm -hmm. 
when you see somebody who and it's not like I'm trying to say you know like oh like you know you shouldn't culturally appropriate that's not what I'm saying you know but I also don't think that food is kind of like this uh, this you know square on the playground that people try to make it out to be where it's just like this free-for-all and everybody as long as you're like in the square you're in the safe space and everybody can just do whatever they want to do I don't think of that at all you know I think that you know there are definitely ways um you need uh, let's put it this way if that food comes from a place that has a significant amount of suffering and um colonization and injustice and you didn't experience any of that shit in any of the generations of your family then you probably shouldn't be monetizing off of it without Mm. without trying to also bring somebody up from that culture Mm -hmm. that's what i think yes well thank you for your thoughts on that um, let's see, uh, somebody has a question. I know you talked a little bit about um, diversity um, and publishing and somebody's asking um, if you have any advice on legitimate publishing services. Can you say that to me one more time, please? Yes, do you have any advice on legitimate publishing services? What is considered a legitimate publishing service? Like a publishing house? Um, Do they want to clarify in the chat, like which presses? You mean like which publication houses, like Penguin, Ten Speed, Clark Partisan, right? Okay. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Give me the question one more time. <laughs> okay. Um. Here, let me read the whole thing to you. Yes. So it says, "Thank you for addressing diversity." Uh. But anyways, I have a culinary memoir in the works and is releasing in 2024. Any advice on legitimate publishing services? I don't have any advice on the publishing houses. Um, I don't, I'm not the type of person that is going to say which one is better than the other. I honestly don't know. And I'm also not a person that's going to say if self-publishing is right for a person or it isn't right for a person. So I don't, if you have a culinary memoir and it's already gonna be published, then that means that you already have a publisher that is interested, which is great. You should celebrate that because that is our, that's pretty much like the hardest part anyway. So even if that, even if you were with that publisher and it was like the worst publisher ever, you still have a publisher. <laughs> you still have a publisher. <laughs> and unless you can get another publisher, it's like, well, we're gonna have to we write at dawn, as they say. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a ton of, I just don't know enough about. Even though I'm a published author, you know, it's not like I didn't get the um how do you say it i didn't get the privilege of getting into like a bidding war or getting multiple offers from different publishing houses you know like i had only gotten i think i had gotten three offers from three different publishing houses at the time that 10 speed reached out to me there was only two other publishing houses that were interested in me so, and uh, one was extremely small, one was like semi-small, and then 10 Speed was like, you know, one of the bigger ones. So I don't, I don't have enough um, research or experience to even have like um, anything to say on that matter, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay, thank you for answering that question. Um, let's see, next one is, what are some of the challenges when working with farmers, collaborators, and PR when you're in California? Um, I personally haven't had any challenges from being the, the distance because the, the challenges that I've had with the farmers in PR are the same challenges that uh, people that I know have had that are in PR. 
you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> um, like you know, like my colleague Tara Mesosa, like you know, she's in Puerto Rico. She deals with farmers all the time, and she's there all the. No, she's not there all the time. She splits her time in between New York and there, but she's there for the majority of the time. <laughs> the challenges that she faced it there are literally the same challenges that I face doing business from California to there. But it also helps that I am in Puerto Rico one one to two times a year. So while I'm there, I can get a lot done. You know, and when I'm there, I stay because the flight takes so long from the West Coast anyway. So when I'm there, I stay for a good chunk of time. Okay. And somebody would like to know, what are the most important ingredients to have in the kitchen before cooking from your book? Uh, sofrito, obviously. Sofrito, yes. <laughs> I would say sofrito and sofrito, olives, tomato sauce. Those three things are literally in almost everything. Almost all of our savory cooking, you know, and even though I always tell people like even though sofrito kind of shows up everywhere, mm -hmm. you would think that everything would taste the same, but it doesn't, because it all depends on what else is being cooked with, the length of time that it's being cooked, all that stuff. Okay, let's see. Thank you. Okay, so now everybody knows. Um, just have sofrito ready <laughs> when you. <really> <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Like you're not cooking Puerto Rican food without sofrito. It's just not going to happen. Yes, I think I remember in one of your interviews, you or um, or you might have mentioned in your newsletter how you do sofrito. Is it at the beginning and the end? Of the I when I'm cooking for myself, I just add it towards the end. If I'm cooking for other Puerto Ricans, I add it at the beginning and the end, just so they don't like you know complain and all that <laughs> stuff to me. Yeah, so I don't have to listen to them complain. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. And, you know, it's hard to believe, Ileana, but we're getting uh, pretty close to the hour here already. <laughs> Time okay. seems like it just flew by. So we have one more question for you. Okay. And that is, um, your book is titled Diasporican, which is a blending of diaspora and Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. What should readers of this book understand about what it means to be diasporican? <clears throat> I I mean is anybody really going to understand what it means to be a diasporican if you're not a diasporican you know like there's so many we, you're here in the United States like everyone is from everywhere you know so th there are versions of diasporicans almost in every culture you know like once you know <clears throat> if you are from you know Mexico once you come here like you're a part of the diaspora you know like even though we're so, we're so close to it but we're so close and so close and yet so far it's not like you have you know freedom to go back and forth you are you become part of the diaspora and I mean even you know with people who have been here for you know generations since like the turn of the century you know like with you know we see so many you know people who grew up here as italians you know italian americans and they think that you know they're going to go to italy and see you know themselves and it's extremely different it's like yeah because you're part of the diaspora now you're not really italian you know you are but you're not welcome to the club that's what being you know a diasporican is you are but you're not you know and there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like for so long, we were meant to feel ashamed by the separation of, you know, economic necessity, you know, because everybody leaves for a reason, you know, if things were great where they were, then people would stay, you know, and we were meant to feel you know, ashamed by all those things and what kind of occurs through time, um, you know, and geographical distance. But, you know, I, that's what I'm trying to, you know, talk about in my book is that, you know, the, yeah, there are times that I feel embarrassed, but we also need to start learning how to celebrate those things, how to celebrate those differences that, you know, wherever we, whatever we are now, it's because the generation that made the move made us this way. And it's what was supposed to happen. 
I mean, not necessarily us, you know, forgetting the language, but the rest of the stuff, you know, like becoming relatively successful and being more, having more access to education and all that stuff. Like, you know, we are a result of that. So anybody can be a diasporican, you know, like whether you, your family's Italian and you came here in the 1800s or whether, you know, you came from Mexico like five years ago, like. Yes, definitely. Um, and so I know I said that was the last question, but somebody added one that I <laughs> wonder, do you mind if I ask one more question? Sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, one, one of our participants says they're curious about why you add the sofrito at the end instead of at the beginning. Can you share why? And they also wanted to know that they love your book. Okay. Um, I mean, when you think, when, okay, so when you make a sofrito, you take, here's how I make mine. I'm, not everybody makes it the same way, right? Here's how I make mine. I take fresh tomatoes. Let's say, Okay, let's say it's summertime, right? And I go to the farmer's market, which I do. And you go to the farmer's market and there are tables and just tables packed full of, you know, piles of fresh, ripe heirloom tomatoes and crazy bundles of fragrance and bright green cilantro and really great onions. And not like them soft ball sized onions at the supermarket, like the little tiny onions that are still really sweet. You know, I love the little tiny onions. And they're, not, they're onions, they just haven't grown to soft ball size, right? Okay. And fresh garlic, that the garlic has literally been grown like, you know, maybe like within like 90 miles or from where you are. And pep peppers and not just you know because we can't get aji dulces here where i am which is like the chosen pepper for sofrito but i can get you know really fresh bell peppers or really fresh cuban nails or really fresh banana and gypsy peppers or anaheims especially this summer just all kinds of peppers 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 okay i get all that stuff and recal because there's a lady at the farmer's market that has recal now shout out to that lady primes I come home, I take all that stuff, I chop it down, I put it in the blender. So now we're talking about some extremely prime, vibrant, flavorful produce that's about to go into your dish, right? Just amazing flavors. Okay. At their peak. It's essentially almost like a pesto when you get all this basil and stuff like that, right? The Italians coddle the damn pesto, okay? They don't even cook the pesto, right? Like, you take the hot pasta, oh, you have to put it into the pesto, though. The pesto, you can't upset the pesto, right? Because the pesto has to remain vibrant and fresh and bright. That's essentially what I'm trying to do with the sofrito. If I'm cooking it, the first step is to put the sofrito with the oil. By the time that you add the olives, the protein, the tomato sauce, and you've cooked the shit out of it for like an hour, guess what flavor is not really prevalent anymore? The sofrito. Well, what is the purpose of you taking all these wonderful, great in-season ingredients and then just masking them and making them disappear? Yes, I want them to add flavor to the broth, which is the reason why I will sometimes do both by adding in the beginning, but I also want that to be the first thing that people taste when they, when they eat it, which a lot of people do. That's the first thing that so many people say. They're like, you know, oh, wow, like, you know, this is flavorful. Yeah, it's flavorful because that's the first thing that you're tasting is that sofrito. I turn off the heat and I add a little bit of sofrito right at the end. So it doesn't even really cook that long. But not only that, when I take it and I drape the sauce, you know, and I pour it over the rice, you can see all the flecks of the green from the cilantro de recal. You can see all the flecks from the peppers and the red little flecks from the tomato skins and all that stuff. That's why. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm very hungry now. <laughs> 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 okay, well, we've now got into the hour. Thank you so much, Eliana, for the wonderful conversation and for taking the time to answer all the questions about your wonderful uh, Diaz Porican cookbook. 
Um, also, thank you to everyone who joined us tonight. Please check out San Mateo County Library's upcoming author talks at smcl.org slash author talks. We would also appreciate it if you could tell us how SMCL did with this program at smcl.org slash rate this event. Okay. Anything you'd like to uh, say, Ileana? <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night.